All right, uh, the sermon this morning is called How to Handle a Storm. So this story in Matthew 14 is quite familiar, but I'll go over it just briefly for people that may not be so familiar with the story and uh, some lessons that we can get from this story of Jesus coming to the disciples in the ship, calming the storm, of how we can handle storms in our life. I mean, storms in the Bible, uh, or storms in Christianity and in sermons are often used to talk about, you know, like when we're going through hard times, you know, whether that's, you know, you're struggling with things or other things. Uh, there's plenty of struggles that we have in life and uh, we can learn how some lessons from this storm that hopefully will encourage us and help us this morning. So just a brief overview of the story that we're focusing on this morning where the disciples get into a ship and Jesus comes out to them. Uh, we'll go through it together first. Matthew 14, 22. Straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So he just, he just finished preaching. He gets his disciples to go across you know, this sea while he goes somewhere away to pray. So now he's like physically separated from his disciples. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. So as the disciples are crossing over the sea, well, when they get into the middle of the sea, now there's a storm that starts coming up, a tempest, right? And, you know, they're, I guess they're in a bit of trouble and they're worried for their lives. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. So this is obviously a miracle of Jesus where he comes out to them and he's walking on water. This is the, the walking on water miracle. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. So they see a figure on the sea walking towards them. They're thinking it's like a ghost, right? Like something coming to, uh, coming to get them. And they were fearful. They didn't realize it was actually Jesus walking on the water to them. But straightway, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. So this is one of the interesting things in the story that Peter, you know, actually asked to come and walk on the water to Jesus, and he actually gets to. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. So he starts looking around. He realizes, oh, I'm in the midst of the sea. There's waves going up. Starts to get a bit fearful and doubtful. He starts to sink. He was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cries, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand. So you can see save in the Bible doesn't always refer to salvation because this is not Peter saying, Lord, save me for salvation. He's just physically getting saved there. So the context is always important when you're using verses. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. So interesting that. As soon as he gets into the ship, the, the storm just ceases. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. All right, so what's a couple of lessons that we can learn from this? Hopefully these encourage you this morning. Number one, like so how to handle a storm Number one is that you are never alone. You are never alone. And, uh, you know, sometimes we forget this. You know, when, we're walking, when we live in this world and we're walking by sight, we think sometimes we go through our problems all by ourselves. We go through life's challenges alone. There's nobody doing this with me. But that's not true, is it? Right? You are never alone. And even in this passage, we see here that they thought they were alone, right? Because you remember, Jesus sent them away and he stayed on the shore, right? And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. So you can see there that physically they were separated and they may have felt alone. And that's like sometimes in your life, you may feel that Jesus is not with you. And this is when you have to remind yourself not to walk by sight, what you can see, what you can feel, but what you know to be true. That's how you walk by faith. So you may feel that Jesus is not with you during the hard times, 
but that is not true. And hard times are, you know, there's all different sorts of situations when it comes to hard times, right? They could be health, relationships, you know, financial situations. It could be, you know, persecution, you know, and, um, you know, everyone has different challenges in life and you can apply these same principles to these same things. And that's why, you know, when we think about how to handle a storm, there's so many different types of storms in life that if you think about these principles, they may help you to walk by faith, not by sight. Now in Mark 6, Mark 6 is a parallel passage of, you know, this uh, Matthew 14 passage. I want to show you an interesting thing here in Mark 6. It's a straight way. He constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land. Look at this in verse 48. And he saw them. You see that? He saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. So sometimes you think, you know, you know I feel alone. Sometimes you think, God doesn't care about my problems. But if you see in this, this story here, that he sent them away knowing that they were going to be apart from him, but yet, you think he just went into a mountain to pray, doing his own thing. But no, he, he knows that they were out there. He was watching them toiling on the sea. So sometimes we think we're alone, but no. God, you are not alone. Jesus is always with you, and Jesus takes an interest in what happens in your life. You know, sometimes we think God is like a human being, like he's too busy. Like us, you know, we're too busy. We can't possibly have all our fingers in every pie. Our attention can only be in one place. I mean, God is not like that. You know, God has as much attention on you as he has on somebody else. It's not like he gets busy, right? It's not like he has, doesn't have enough time. So, you know, we ought to remember that so that we know that when we go through, you know, difficult times in life, we do not go through them alone. We have the Lord Jesus Christ with us. Look at Hebrews 13, 5. I mean, we often use this passage for salvation, but it, it also refers to the fact, I mean, the, the fact that we're saved, we have the Holy Ghost living inside us. I mean, we have God with us all the time. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I mean, the Great Commission ends with verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, lo means uh, look, right? That's the short for look. Lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Right, so number one is you are never alone. You may feel alone. You may think you're alone, but that's not the truth. You know, when you're feeling alone, you're walking by sight, right? You're walking in the flesh because the truth is when we walk by flesh, Jesus is always there with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He is with us always, even unto the end of the world, right? That's one way. All right, number two. Number two is to realize that God gives suffering. You know, sometimes when people go through hard times, they immediately think, God has forsaken me. God, you know, why is God letting me go through this? Well, that's a true statement. God is letting you go through it. But then, you know, this is what you have to remember, like how to handle a storm. Sometimes God intends the storm for your life, right? And we, I think we see this here in Matthew 4. I think, obviously, Jesus knew when he sent his disciples away that they were going to hit a storm. Right? He knew that they were going to be struggling on the sea. I mean, he, he, he knew all this was going to happen. And what's interesting is when he goes away alone, he sees them toiling on the sea, as we saw in Mark 6, and notice he doesn't immediately go to save them. Right? He's letting them toil on the sea. You know, it's, it's like a bit of a test to see, like, how are you going to handle this? It's, you know, suffering and hardship and challenges in our life, it reveals a lot about yourself teaches you and it helps you to grow there's a lot of positive things that come out of these challenges god knows this that's why he allows you to go through these storms and it's interesting that he's watching them toiling on the sea and it says here in the fourth watch of the night he didn't go the first watch second watch the third watch it's like the last watch of the night because generally people think the night is like each watch is three hours if you divide like 12 hours by three hours so he's going at the very end of the night you know then he goes out to go save them. So you see how he, he's allowing them to 
go through this storm and give them this challenge and then it tests them, it grows them. I reckon here what he's trying to show them is that they, they, they have little faith. You know, I mean, they're the disciples of Jesus. Like they, they're meant to know who Jesus is, that Jesus is God walking on the earth and yet they're in a rowboat. I mean, there's another scenario we'll look at later where Jesus is on the boat with them and they're scared. So, you know, he's teaching them that they, they have to walk by faith, not by sight. And that's the same with us when we go through hard times. We need to walk by faith, not always by sight. So we see here that the trials in your life, they can be, they can be from God. Not every trial in your life is from God. Some is self-inflicted. Some may be supernatural, right? There are, uh, some may be caused by somebody else, right? Like some other evil person, like evil people in this world, right? Causing hardship. In, in our country, right? So sometimes it's caused by other people as well. But trials in your life can be from God. Let me just turn these on. They have, a, they have like a two hour timer, so. Let's see they. Okay. Trials in your life can be from God. They're not always from God. But you know what? Trials, challenges, hardships in your life they are certainly permitted by God, right? So, they got, so God does allow them to happen. They're not always caused by him, you know? It's like with Job, you know? He, he, he allowed Satan to tempt Job, but it was Satan's idea on what to do to Job, right? He just said, you can't kill him, can't touch him, set some boundaries. But he certainly allowed it to happen. And, and you know, this is a, it's a big topic, and I've preached on this many times, but a lot of people get stuck on why does God allow suffering? And ultimately, the end of the day, the, the short answer is, is because it molds us. You know, that's why we sung, molding a masterpiece. You know, molding something can take a bit, of, a bit of heat, a bit of pressure, a bit of change, a bit of discomfort. You, know, you think about you know, molding like on a rock. You need to like hit the rock to mold it, but you create a masterpiece. And that's what God is doing with our lives. He's trying to mold us into the image of Jesus Christ, don't think or expect that that process is necessarily comfortable. <laughs> so trials in our life, certainly permitted by God, there's different sorts of trials. We talk about it, you know, health, relationship, financial, persecution, maybe addictions. People have addictions that they're trying to get over, and that's a challenge in their life. But we need to understand that trials can come from God. He certainly permits them. So we need to grow from them, not get bitter from them. Philippians 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you may stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in nothing, terrified by your adversaries. So this is talking about persecution here, which is to them an evident token of perdition. So he's saying, he's saying the fact that you know, these people are persecuting believers is a good, good idea, good, good evidence that they're not saved. But to you of salvation, and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, look at this, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me, and now here to be in me. So he's like, you saw me getting persecuted for the faith, you heard about me getting persecuted in the faith, and you know what? That's coming to you too, as they say to the Philippians. It's not only given to you to just believe on Christ and be saved, you've got some suffering to go through that God has for you to grow. You know, and, uh, you know, grow and to get better from it. So it's good to suffer. It's good for things to push you and make you uncomfortable because that's how you grow. Right? For, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, look at what uh, Paul says here. Paul, you know, we all know Paul had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. Some people think it's a sickness. I personally think it was like somebody that was giving him a hard time. You know, like an arch nemesis that we don't know who was. I mean, he had a lot of persecutors. Um, you know, what was it? Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. This is why I think it's a person. But some people think thorn in the flesh, they just think it's like a, like a you know, health problem, health challenge. Maybe it was a supernatural health challenge as opposed to just a natural health challenge of old age or whatever. But uh, we see here in 2 Corinthians 12, one of the benefits of going through hard times and have suffering in your life is it keeps you humble as well. 
You know, like pride is a, is a terrible thing to think that you're more than you ought to. And, and Paul is saying here, like, you know, lest he should be, you know, like everyone should like basically worship him because of the revelations he has. He says, well, he was given this thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. So he's saying three times he asked the Lord to remove this thing, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, this is God's reply to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. Look at this. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions. Gosh, can we say that? I take pleasure. Man, here's a man walking by faith, knowing why hard things happen in his life, where he can say, you know what? Thank God that God is molding me into somebody better. I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. All right? Uh, may God help us to have that attitude as we handle storms in our life. Number three, number three is create your opportunities. Create your opportunities. What do I mean by that? Well, we know in the story in Matthew 14 that Peter walked on water. I mean, that's an amazing thing. Like, what an experience if you had to walk on water. Do you know whose idea it was? It was Peter's. Right? It wasn't Jesus' idea. Like Peter saw Jesus walking on the water and he thought, you know what? If, Pete, if Jesus can walk on water, maybe Jesus can make me walk on water. Hey, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And the lesson here is, is that you know, sometimes when things are hectic and you're in the storm, opportunities can open. But if you're too you know, focused on you know, the, the, being depressed or being overcome, you, your eyes may not be open to grasp that opportunity, whether it's an opportunity to grow, whether it's an opportunity to do great things for God, opportunity to take a stand, whatever that opportunity is, you know, maybe to start a work or a ministry or something, if, if you're too down and out in the challenge, your eyes won't be open to create that opportunity like Peter here. So he, it's his idea. Get out and walk on the water. And even though, you know, you can say he failed where he started to sink, but man, what a thing to be able to walk on water out to Jesus. <coughs> so sometimes great things <coughs> are done in the middle of a storm. You know why? Because sometimes when everything is smooth sailing, you can become complacent, can't you? You, 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 you get too comfortable when everything is going smooth. But, you know, sometimes during a storm you can create the opportunity to do something great. Proverbs 16.9, look at what it says here. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. You see, it doesn't work like that in Christianity where God's just going to dictate to you every decision in life. You know, God gives us guiding principles, right, where he directs our steps. But you devise your way, right? You think about what do you, you have a choice in life and which way you walk, but God is going to guide you, right? It's the same here with Peter. Peter had an idea, but the Lord directed his steps, right? Psalm 37, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. There's a song that was written after by this uh, verse as well. Oh, I always, always think of it every time I read this verse, that song. But, uh, man, look at this verse. Does that, does that not line up well with the story in Matthew 14? You know, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I mean, Peter's walking on the water. Jesus is helping him to walk on the water. But though he fall, he won't be utterly cast down. You ask Jesus to save him, the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I just thought this is just great how it all ties together. Now, even though you create your own opportunities... It has to be in the will of God, right? You don't create your opportunities contrary to the will of God, right? You don't create some opportunity where you now you can't go soul winning, you can never go to church, too busy to do anything for God. I mean, that is not an opportunity that is created by God, right? And we see here, even when Peter said, bid me come unto thee on the water, 
Did he just jump out of the boat and just go? No. Jesus said, come. Right? So you can see he waited to see if it was God's will. Right? He knew it was God's will, but then he stepped out of the boat to come to Jesus. So we're not talking about just creating our own opportunities, whatever we want to do. We need to create our opportunities in accordance with God's will, accordance with the Bible. Said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Right? So it's an amazing thing that, uh, you know, Peter walks on the water to Jesus. And, um, you know, sometimes when you do great things for God, you got to be, you got to, Put yourself out there. You've got to step out in faith like Jesus. You've got to do it according to the will of God. But you know what you also have to be aware of? You have to be aware of the boat talk. You know, people say the boat talk. What is it? That's probably the disciples. Maybe they're saying, ah, you know, you can't walk on water. No, oh, look at this guy, hot shot, you know. He, he has to go and walk out to Jesus. Why couldn't he just wait for Jesus to come to him? You know, we don't know if the disciples had that attitude, but sometimes people use this story and say hey beware of the boat talk because you know when you try and do great things you step out in faith you put yourself out there there's going to be the trolls and the naysayers right but don't let them stop you if it's in the will of god forge forward and step out hey like we said with peter maybe he didn't make it the whole way but hey he got to walk on water right so i think we should do that don't don't be fearful of failing Right? Because sometimes when you try and you fail, you still do more than most people. <laughs> All right? So, create your opportunities. Right? Don't be so down and out that you close your eyes to things that you can do. Proverbs 16, a man's heart divides... Oh, we already talked about those, didn't we? Oh, that's, that's what I wanted to say. I wanted to show here. That the Lord directed his steps, and I want to compare this to Proverbs 3.5. This is a very familiar passage to a lot of people it's on a lot of posters a lot of plaques people are handing up in their homes they uh, the verse that's sold in all sorts of christian stores proverbs 3 5 trust in the lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding look at this <coughs> in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths so you see here it's not about just walking according to your own will and just hoping god will bless whatever you do to walking according to the will of God, because why? As you walk, you don't lean not unto your own understanding, and in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Okay, so that's create your own opportunities. Number four is how to handle a storm. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Now we remember when Peter stepped out of the boat, what did he do? He saw the wind boisterous. You see how he took, his, he took his eyes off Jesus, started to look at, you know, getting fearful, looking at the things around him, and that's when he started to sink. So the lesson here is, hey, when we're going through challenging times, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses. How do we keep our eyes on Jesus? Right, what's, what's the practice? You know, a lot of people, they say, oh, trust Jesus, trust Jesus, keep your eyes on Jesus. Well, let's think about some practical ways to how we keep our eyes on Jesus. Let us lay aside every weight. So what is every weight? Sometimes good things in life can get heavy. So, you know, pleasure, relaxation, hobbies, you know, holidays. These things are not necessarily bad in and of themselves. You need a bit of R&R, &R, you know, rest and relaxation. You need to recuperate. But sometimes these weights in our life, we start taking on too many of them. They hold us back from running this race. Right? They hold us back from this fight. So let us lay aside every weight, get too much of this weight out of our life, and the sin which doth so easily beset us. So you see, some of the weights in our life, it's not necessarily sin. Obviously, sin can keep us back too when we're doing the wrong things. All right? So this is how we can keep our eyes on Jesus. We lay aside the weight, lay aside the sin. We try and lighten our burden in our life so we can be a more effective runner, so, which so easily beset us, keeps us back, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him, before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. What does it mean to keep your eyes on Jesus? One is to get rid of the weights. Too much excess in your life. Right? Too much pleasure, riches, cares of this life. Right? We want to get rid of some of that. Some of that is needed, right? It's not bad. Some of that's needed, but you want to have a lean kind of spiritual life, right? We've got to cut the sin out of our life. We keep our eyes on Jesus. How? One is consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself. See, when you go through a storm, you go through a hard time, and you think about what Jesus has gone through, it doesn't seem as bad, does it? It's like sometimes, sometimes we, you know, I'll be honest with you guys, we have it pretty easy. Even during COVID, maybe people have lost their jobs, maybe times have been hard, but Jesus had it harder. People have had it a lot harder than we have. We haven't had it as hard as other people have. And sometimes that's one way, you know, we kind of keep our eyes on Jesus as we know that things could be a lot worse. And that encourages us to go through these minor storms sometimes in our lives. You know, they're a lot easier than what other people have gone through. But also it's just... How do we keep our eyes on Jesus? I mean, <clears throat> it's being mindful of the word, but it's also having faith in the word. When people say, trust Jesus, have faith in Jesus, what does that mean? Well, Jesus is the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Trusting Jesus, faith in Jesus is not just this nebulous, ambiguous, emotional thing. It is we read the Word of God, which is Jesus. We consider, meditate upon the Word of God. Meditate is not clearing your mind of anything. Meditating in the Bible is when we consider Him. We think about the Word of God. We read the Word. We consider the Word. We think about how to apply the principles we learn in the Word. And when we go through hard times, you think about like what you're learning here today, how to handle a storm, Jesus is always there with you, Je you know, Jesus gives you suffering, all this sort of stuff. That's how you keep your eyes on Jesus. Right? It's not just this nebulous, ambiguous, oh, Jesus is there with me, you know, and I just have filled with emotion. No, there's a practical, logical side of it, which is, there's the Word of God. How am I guided by God? I read the Word of God. How do I have faith in God? I have faith in His Word. You cannot separate God from his word. Don't think of these things as separate things. We have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Right? So the words of the Bible, when we talk about these living words, they are the Spirit of God. And we trust on that word. We're guided by that word. That word lives in us. So that's why, you know, a lot of people, you know, really, you know, and, and Christianity obviously has an emotional side. I'll say I'm not necessarily an emotional person. I'm just saying that sometimes it's over-emotionalized, right? Where it just becomes this nebulous thing where it's all about how you feel. And that's not how Christianity works. We have faith in, some, in a word, right? We just don't have faith in, in nothing, right? So that's how you practically have faith in God. That's how you practically keep your eyes on Jesus, right? And Peter didn't do that. See, when he saw the wind, boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And you can see here that when he was truly in trouble, right, immediately. Remember when they were on the sea toiling? Jesus knew they could handle it. So he left them. Fourth watch of the night, he comes onto the sea. When Peter's going down and he really needs help, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Right? So, we see here in this story that the fear we feel in life when we go through hard times, really what it comes down to is a lack of faith. Now, when we talked about what faith, trusting Jesus is not an evidence, faith is believing what God's word says. That's what it comes down to. So, why are we fearful? Because we don't believe Jesus is there with us. We don't believe Jesus is molding us through it. We don't believe that. God allows us to go through suffering and it's good for us. And, you know, like Paul said, we should take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and things like that. 
So that's why ultimately when we're fearful, when we're full of fear, it comes down to a lack of faith. And this is what Jesus is teaching them in this passage. He says, O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Why were you fearful? Because you had little faith in God's word. And that's a good reminder on us. So that's why when we keep our eyes on Jesus about having faith in his word, ultimately fear is a lack of faith in God. And when he was, uh, this is Matthew 8, 23, when he was entered into a ship, there's other examples where Jesus talks about fear and faith. His disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea. So this is the passage where I was telling you that this time Jesus is actually with them on the boat. There arose a great tempest in the sea and so much that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Now what does that teach you? So, you know, we have the disciples to toiling and fearful in the storm. In this example, Jesus is with them on the boat. They're toiling, but what is, what is Jesus doing? He's sleeping. And that just goes to show, the lesson there in our life is that just goes to show that even during the storms of life, you can have peace. Right? Here's God in the flesh, in a storm, but he's sound asleep. Right? So that just goes to just because you're going through hard times and challenges in your life, that doesn't mean it has to be stressful. Right? You can still have peace if you are like Jesus. Right? You try and have a mindset like Jesus. He can be asleep. His disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful? Look at this. O ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Mark 4, I'll show you this passage. Mark 4, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat unto the ship, into the ship, so that it was now full. So this is a parallel passage with Matthew, with the same storm where he's with them. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, so the back end of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, look at this, didn't this just reveal to you the lack of faith? Right, and why they're fearful? Look, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Isn't that our attitude sometimes when we're going to? It's like, God, you don't care about what I'm going through? Don't you, don't, you, don't you say that? I can't believe, you know, God doesn't care about me anymore. He's letting me go through this. That's this attitude of the disciples. Going in there, seeing him asleep. You don't think Jesus knows what's going on? Right, this is a lack of faith. Carest thou not? I mean, how could you say that about Jesus? That you don't care about me? He says, I love you with an everlasting love and all these sorts of things. Carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the sea and said unto the sea, Peace be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm and he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And what does that mean? That you don't believe me. <laughs> Jesus, right? You don't believe God's word. You don't believe that God loves you. He's there with you. He's allowing you to go through these things. All these things. That's the cause of our fear. Last one. How to handle a storm. Number five is don't be surprised. Right? We know these things about God's word. We know who Jesus is. We know he's going to allow us. We don't have to be shocked when we go through these things. Right? It shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't catch us off guard. I can't believe I'm going through hard times. You know, it's like people buy into this prosperity gospel. You think that when you become a Christian, you just everything's smooth sailing for you. You just have to read the New Testament, and you know that that's not the case, right? Where hard times are coming, right? And, and they're there for good reason. So we shouldn't be shocked by these things. And how am I tying it in with this story, with this uh, Jesus calming the storm walking on the boat? Is that if the disciples had known their Old Testament and known who was with them in the boat, they would have read this. And this is why I always thought, <coughs> I remember hearing like this video on YouTube once, and that's why you always got to remember, like when you're listening to sermons on YouTube, it's people's opinions. It's like now, you're listening to sermons, my opinions. But I remember hearing somebody talking about Jesus calming the sea and he was saying like, oh, you know, Jesus came on the scene and he was just doing his own thing and just like, it's calming the sea and the disciples had never seen this stuff before. And then I read this passage in Psalm 107 and I thought, you know what? If the, if the disciples knew their Bibles, they would have known this passage 
And they would have known that when Jesus calmed the storm, you know what he was doing? He was actually proving he was the God of the Old Testament. Because look at what this says here. And, and you tell me, you know, when we read through this, how similar this is to this calming of the storm in the New Testament. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. What were the disciples? Fishermen. Right? They see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven. They go down again to their depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits' end. It's them toiling in the sea. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. Look at this. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that man, this is what we read at the beginning of this sermon, uh, beginning of this church today. Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. So don't be surprised. They shouldn't have been surprised if they knew that God in the flesh was with them, that he could calm the sea, raise up the storm. I mean, you know, it says here, they that do business in great waters, they see the works of the Lord. So we see that in this, these passages about these storms too, that if they had just stopped to consider who Jesus was, they wouldn't be surprised at what they're going through. Mark 6, verse 51. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure. Right? So they're, they're shocked that the, the sea is calm and wondered. But look at this, verse 52. Why were they surprised? For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. So they just been with this man, right, who had just fed, you know, the 5,000, with the, with the loaves and the fishes. And then they, yet they were shocked that this man could calm a storm. Why were they shocked? Because they considered not the miracle of the loaves. They didn't consider who they were with, who they worshipped, who dwells in you. You don't consider that. Matthew 14. And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped, saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So in Matthew 14, we kind of see the opposite, where they consider and they again acknowledge who Jesus is. Okay, so you don't want to be surprised. They realize who Jesus is. And, you know, this is a very comforting truth as we go through the storms of life. So in conclusion, how do you handle a storm? We learn from this story. One is, remember, you are never alone. Never alone. Number two, Remember that suffering, God gives suffering. It comes from God. So don't, don't think it's always Satan. Don't think it's always you know, a bad reason. You know, sometimes God's just allowing you to go through hard times to, to mold you and to grow you. Number three, don't be so down and out that you miss the opportunities to do great things. Because sometimes in a storm, like Peter, there's an opportunity to shine, right? to shine brightly. Number four, keep your eyes on Jesus. Okay, and that's not a nebulous, ambiguous, ambiguous thing. That is, know your Bible. Consider what the Bible says. Use the Bible to guide your decision making. Right? Many principles in the Bible. That's how we walk by faith. We take the Bible. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. We walk by faith by considering the Bible and the principles in the Bible as we make decisions in our life. Right? And that's how we keep our eyes on Jesus. And if we know who Jesus is, hey, don't be surprised when things go well, right? You know, don't be surprised if you're in that situation, right? Because of who Jesus is. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for these stories that we can be encouraged by. And uh, especially when we go through hard times in our life, Lord, I pray that this sermon will give people some good principles, some good things to remember that will encourage them and help them to handle the storms in their life. Lord, help us, <coughs> help us not to be fearful. Help us to be full of faith rather than full of fear. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.